Women's Church. Uh, I want to thank Marie Armentino, who is our liturgist this morning. Linda Sturgis, who is playing our organ. And Callie Boggs, who has been lighting our candles for us. She's our acolyte today. We're so thankful to have so many helpers. Uh, just a couple of announcements to make. Uh, we received a card this week and a box with gifts. And so I wanted you to know, this is Dear Pastor Lynn, I pray these come in handy when things finally get back to normal. Blessings from Pastor Jean and the Missions Committee of Bethany United Methodist Church. Thank you to Bethany who donated us several The Faith We Sing books so that we can have enough in our seats. So we are thankful, thankful for that. All right. And the other announcement that we have is a reminder that on the first Sunday of August, which will be next Sunday at 9 a.m., we will have, weather permitted, our first outdoor service. And so we're very excited for that. Uh, we have some special things planned for that, and uh, we pray that you'll be able to make it. And now, I'll turn things over to Marie. Lord, open our hearts this morning to hear your words of compassion. Lord, help us to truly listen to you. Lord, open our spirits this morning to strengthen our faith. Lord, help us to work for you. Lord, make us ready to serve. Lord, make us ready to witness to your healing love. Please join me in the opening prayer. Lord of mercy and compassion, be with us this day as we he hear of the healing love of Jesus. Remind us that we are also recipients of his compassion, and we are called to bring the same hope and love to others. Prepare us for his service in his name. Amen. Our first hymn is, Our God is an Awesome God. My bones suffer mortal agony, as my foes taught me. 
saying to me all day long, Where is your God? My soul, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. New Testament reading is Matthew 8, 14 through 17. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Thank you so much, Marie. 
It's lovely having you as our liturgist, and we are thankful to the choir who worked so hard on their recording today to do that beautiful song of Love Lifted Me for Us. And now for our morning message. <clears throat> We're marching right along this summer, aren't we, with our sermon series of hope, inspired by Jesus' many miracles as described from the Gospel of Matthew. So far, we've had two, the healing of the leper and the healing of the Roman centurion slave. Now in both cases, the people who received the miracle were people who had been discriminated against. The leper, we learned, was not allowed at all within the community. Lepers were so discriminated against that leprosy was considered to be a living death. And the Roman centurion slave was a slave. So we need to remember that slaves were considered to be on about the same level as animals concerning human rights. They really didn't have any. And although sl slavery wasn't racially motivated or as horrific as it was in the American South, it still was very difficult. And people did not respect slaves at all. Well, today's miracle is much more of a personal, close-to-home nature. Today, we have a quick look into the family life of one of Jesus' disciples, Peter. Now, this miracle is told in Mark's gospel as well, and from there, we learn that it took place in Capernaum on a Sabbath day after coming home from the synagogue. And of course, Matthew tells us that Jesus went to Peter's home. So Peter, whom we know was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, he had a home in the city of Capernaum. We also know that Peter was married and that his mother-in-law was living with them. Now, perhaps she was a widow or perhaps Peter and his family lived with both of his in-laws. Scripture don't tell us those details, but what we do have, we see enough to know that Peter lived in a family just like us. We're a long distance in both time and location from when Matthew wrote his gospel. So when Matthew tells us that Peter's mother-in-law had a fever, we may think, oh, she was just a bit under the weather and stayed home from worship that day. Well, thankfully, we have scholars to help us understand a bit deeper and make a bridge of understanding for us. Because this was no fever of only, oh, 99.5 degrees, say. No, this was a whopper. In fact, people in Matthew's day would have put two plus two together to equal four. They would have gone, oh, Capernaum, yes. That's that town that's near where the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee come together, and it's very marshy, and there's so many mosquitoes there. Is that a clue for you for what the illness was that Peter's mother-in-law most likely had? Well, there were three common fevers in that day from diseases. They were Malta fever, which lasted for months and was characterized by wasting away and often ended in death. There was a fever that was very much like typhoid fever, another illness that often caused death. And there was the most prevalent, especially in Capernaum, which was malaria. Now, for many years, the United Methodist Church has been on a mission to wipe out malaria in the developing world. When our Imagine No Malaria campaign first began as Nothing But Nets back in 2006, a person died of malaria every five seconds. Bishop Thomas Bickerton, he stood before the General Conference that year and he held up a $10 bill. He said to everyone present, $10, it represents your lunch today a lunch you could eat, or it represents a life that you can save. Buy a net and save a life. 
He placed that $10 bill on a table in the middle of the arena in the Fort Worth Convention Center, and we have been dedicated ever since 2006 to eradicating this deadly disease to both children and the elderly. Now, according to the World Health Organization, anyone over the age of 40 is more likely to die from malaria. Isn't that interesting? So apparently, malaria, I guess I could say that I'm a senior citizen now because I'm over 40. <laughs> so that's the at-risk population, of course, as well as children. And again, we are speculating, but Peter's mother-in-law would, I would think, have been in that category. And whichever of these three diseases she had, it was one that was life-threatening. But considering the marshy ground in the area, mosquitoes bred and flourished in Capernaum. So malaria was the most prevalent disease there. So the most important thing, though, that we need to remember is this. She didn't have any small fever that would go away on its own. She was not just sleeping in that morning for some extra rest. The truth of the matter is, it was a very high fever and the woman was extremely sick. Most likely, she would have died. And despite it being the Sabbath, a day of rest, and despite Jesus needing rest himself, because he was so tired, I'm sure, he had done so much work, He'd been teaching, healing, answering questions, offending all the scribes and the Pharisees. Oh, he'd been a busy guy. But here's some wonderful news of hope for us today. Jesus was never too tired to help, even if it was a day of rest. So we, too, can rest assured that we can call out to him at any time in prayer. He won't be on vacation or taking a well-deserved nap. The scriptures tell us he never sleeps, he never slumbers. And scripture tells us clearly that he is right there also at the right hand of God the Father Almighty interceding for us as we pray. How wonderful is that? And that particular day Jesus reached out his hand to touch this very sick mother of Peter's wife. And Matthew tells us that no sooner had Jesus touched her than her fever had left her. Her entire illness had left her. Every symptom that she had was gone. Now I'm sure all of us have experienced a bad sickness at some point or another, a good dose of the flu or something. And once we begin to feel better, it often takes a few days to gain back our strength and be 100% of our health again. Can you imagine having a disease like malaria or typhoid fever or Malta fever and not having to spend several days recovering? But that's not what happened. Jesus fully restored her as he will for us if we but just ask. And this woman immediately, she got up out of bed, and the scriptures tell us she began right away serving Jesus. She had just been saved from the brink of death by Jesus, saved by Jesus for a purpose, to serve him. Wow. What an example this unnamed woman is for us all. Jesus had healed her, he'd saved her, and her one desire was to use her good health to be of service to him and others. Saved to serve. I thought about that a lot this week. We may not have malaria or Malta fever, but we still have something in common with Peter's unnamed mother-in-law who experienced a miracle that day so long ago. Like her, we have received Jesus' saving grace. And from her, we learn this lesson that she models. We are all saved by the amazing grace of God. And we are saved to serve our Lord with whatever gifts that we have. 
The big question is how do we do that when we're social distancing? How do we continue to be in the ministry of service in the name of our Lord when we can't reach out and touch another's hand? Well, I can assure you that the food ministry is going gangbusters from this church every Friday. The pickup of food from Hannaford still continues and we supply the pantry and Joanne Groder and all kinds of people with food insecurity are being fed. So we continue to support that. And if you would like to help out on that, just say the word because I sure assure you there is a need. But there's another way we can still all serve and it is very, very simple. By taking care of each other. Pick up the phone and call one another. Pick up the phone and call. Check in on each other. Look after each other. We're all feeling isolated. Maybe we can't make a meal and deliver it like we'd like to do and have done for each other in the past. But we can send a card in the mail or pick up the phone and call a friend. In this time when we can't physically reach out and touch like Jesus did, taking this woman's hand, whether it's FaceTiming or calling, texting, writing a note, reach out to someone this week. Reach out to others. Why? Because we were all saved to serve. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, we thank you so much that you, for all of the glorious things you have given us. We thank you for the beautiful weather we've had, the sunshine and gardens growing, and the ability to get outside to make things a little easier on us. And yet we remember so many folks are still suffering in isolation from one another. Help us, Lord God, to remember that we can reach out to others and we have been saved to serve, even at such a time as this. We pray for uh, a cure for this pandemic, Lord God, and we continue to pray for our nation in particular as we still see so much strife and division and uh, so many difficult things that are happening. We pray, Lord God, all this and for all those who are in our hearts and minds who are in need of prayer, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. In saying the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom be. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread. bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Marie. And you know what? You're not the first, and you won't be the last, to when leading the Lord's Prayer have a little hiccup. That's something that keeps pastors up. It wakes us up at three in the morning. You know, the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess that up. <laughs> Thank you so much. You've done a great job today. And now it's our time of giving. And in the United Methodist Church, we give from our time, our talent, and our treasure. I want to thank you all for the many ways that you serve, and especially for uh, remembering to set aside your monetary gifts to help us so that we can continue the work of the church and the bills of the church despite not being able to be here in person to worship. Although we're getting there. And now Marie is going to place our heart for us.
it looks to you folks who get this the final the final edited project but uh, I want to thank everyone they've done a marvelous job and our final hymn of the day is how great thou art is not. 